Since 1927, in physics, which is supposed to be the most objective science there is because it deals with the forces around us, we've had a thing called the principle of indeterminacy. The more precisely the position of a subatomic particle is known, is determined, the less precisely the momentum is known in this instant and vice versa. You're tracking around these subatomic atomic quantum particles and you can figure out which way it's going and how fast, but not at the same time. Because the act of observation affects the thing observed. Now, I know nothing about that. Well, quantum physics. But I do know it applies superbly well in the, anything we do with language, people, the social or human sciences, sciences the humanities. That the act of observation changes the thing observed. You want to you know, organize a traffic accident, interview three people, they all see something different. Watch a television program, watch a court trial, they'll all see something different. You know, there is not that objective thing there. We cannot have the thing there and the act of observation in the same time without them influencing each other. That is known as the uncertainty principle or the principle of indeterminacy. It just means that what we observe, what we think we know, is not certain. It could be otherwise. There could be alternatives to it. Okay? And that's certainly the case in anything concerning meaning in language. Simple example. How do you translate sens? There are two or three different ways, syntactically and others, because we could have signification meaning as well. Extended. Uh, is there any way of deciding between them? No. At least as far as I'm concerned, no. We live within indeterminacy. This is an important theory which has sort of run parallel to all the other theories that I'm talking about and it actually came before them. Heisenberg, 1927. Okay, so, and there's all the sciences these days accept indeterminism. None of them pretend to absolute objectivity. None of them. Especially not economics, as you might have noticed in recent years. Okay. Greenspan. Oh, I, I, I made a mistake in my model. Yeah. He thought the banks would regulate themselves. Yeah. Slight indeterminacy in the model. Um, 1958 and then 59, uh, a Harvard professor of philosophy, uh, Willard Van Orman Quine, um, used translation actually to illustrate the principle of indeterminacy in language. It's not just translation, but translation for him illustrated it very well. And he, he uses a thought experiment which runs like this. There is a native in the jungle on the furthest island in the darkest archipelago, says Quine, he writes beautifully. And a rabbit runs by, and there is a linguist there to describe the language, as linguists do. I I've never figured out why there are rabbits in jungles, but in Quine, this is what happens. Okay. And the native points to the rabbit and says, Gavagai. And the linguist writes down, Gavagai equals rabbit. End of story. Okay? Equivalence. No problem. Determined. And then Quine goes on and says, are we sure that Gavagai equals rabbit? Well, it could be, no, a rabbit. <laughs> well, look, that's a rabbit. It could be Gavagai. Would make sense, wouldn't it? I'm told that the name of Peru, is anybody from Peru? Meant my name is Peru. And they asked the native, what country is this? He says, Peru. <laughs> His name is uh, uh, Kangaroo means, look, there's an animal. <laughs> so there have been these actual cases. It could mean a detachable rabbit part. 
delicious back leg, my dinner, could mean there's a flea on the rabbit's left ear, for all you know. It could mean my rabbit, not yours, so don't think about eating it. Okay? Or anything else. Uh, and Quine goes through all the possible ways of saying this, all the possible propositions, and concludes that there will never be any certitude about this translation. There will always be doubts, even, he says, even if the linguist lives there for 20 years, learns the language, marries into the tribe, becomes part of the tribe, there may be this secret knowledge about rabbits that only the old men know of. <laughs> Which is the case in an Australian indigenous culture, we're finding that a lot of the knowledge um, is held by old men and not passed on, and other knowledge is held by the older women as well, and not passed on to the men. You know, it's all these secret meanings around that we don't know about. Indeterminacy has to be this fundamental doubt we have when we use language. In the case of translation, it's easily expressed. You have an input, which is your source text, okay, ST1, and there are several ways of rendering it, TT1, TT2, to TTN. Could be 2, 3, could be 120, I don't know. If there's only one way of rendering it, I personally don't think it's a translation problem. It could be a terminology problem, or it could be a grammar problem. You know, if there's only right and wrong, that's easily done. You don't need to come to a translation theory session to, to figure out that. We only deal with this kind of problem. These are the real ones that we're good at and other people are not so good at. There's no rule. So it's not right or wrong, binary, off and on. The best we can do in our little world here is to be right but, or wrong but. There's always a balancing of options, a weighing up of probabilities, a calculation of risks. Many, many theories have taken this view of language and have tried to apply it to what happens when we translate or interpret. Many of them accept that translations are not always adequate to their sources, and so they talk about not equivalence, as we have in the equivalence paradigm, but similarity. The translation is not the same as the source text. To be similar should be good enough. Okay? The um, English translation theorist Andrew Chesterman talks about similarity a lot. Uh, and there's um, a philosophy of similarity. It's quite a strange thing to be similar. Okay, not to be the same, to be similar. Um, this is Wittgenstein as well, who uses the same metaphors. Um, it's a strange thing that a daughter is like her mother. Right? You can say the daughter is like her mother. But we don't say, ah, the mother is like a daughter. Strange, isn't it? In the same way, we're quite prepared to say the translation is like the original. But we're not going to say the original is like the translation. We don't want to make similarity is directional. It goes more one way than the other. Similarity presupposes anteriority, a time difference, and a value difference as well. To be similar to is somehow to come later than and to be not quite as good as. Well, I don't know, some daughters are better than their mothers. You're all better than them. Okay, so there's that view. And that view of similarity uh, comes to the fore in aesthetic theories, theories of literary translation, very much, where we assume that the source text is this great literary text to which nobody can be entirely adequate. We all only get partial readings, there are many possible translations, etc. Uh, Walter Benjamin, in The Task of the Translator, 1923, suggests that kind of relationship. Uh, all texts are part of the original 
text, all our vernacular languages are but imitations, parts of the broken vessel, which lead back to the original perfect language. pure language. Another view, however, is different and says that indeterminacy is not in the way re language represents language. Indeterminacy is in the very nature of meaning itself at the very beginning. There is not the great text, the great speaker, the great author, the great teacher, to whom we are all inadequate in our attempts to be similar. In the very nature of attempting to be meaningful, there is indeterminacy. And that's the second view that has sort of predominated um, in uh, at least since the 1990s, um, especially in this country, because translation theory basically works in the United States within departments of comparative literature, where people are given to this sort of philosophizing. That second view, where indeterminacy is in the very attempt to be meaningful, uh, is what we could call deconstruction. Okay. Uh, working, going from the work of Jacques Derrida, most of which was published in 1967, so this is not a new theory by any means, uh, Derrida posited that there is no transcendental signified, there is not the signified, the thing meant that is there at the origin, we are all attempting to point towards something there, but everything we point, or all the pointers, are in some way inadequate and merely displace that attempt to be meaningful. A simple example would be a theory du sens. I'd say, do you know what that is? Yeah, sure, mate. I can explain that. But then you pick at it. Is sens meaning? What's the opposite of meaning? Has anybody seen the meaning? Anybody seen the sense, etc.? You pick at it, you pick at the discourse, you undo the bits of language, you keep asking these uncomfortable questions. That is a process of deconstructing. And Derrida's project was not to give the meaning of the text. He's a philosopher. The meaning of Plato's text, or the meaning of Heidegger, or the meaning of uh, okay, anybody else. Uh, but to work on the discourse, to undo it, to show how language is always a poor representation of any original intentionality, to which we will never get. <coughs> Derrida uh, worked on translation occasionally, not in a very good way, to my mind, more in a literary way. When it comes to translation, he's more in that literary sense. However, he, he, um, he does accept that our languages because of their very hybrid nature, all our languages are mixes of other languages. We do not, any of us, have a pure language that we use. Every word we use has been, goes back, draws on centuries, millennia of attempted meaning productions in many other languages. So Derrida would, would say that when we speak, we always speak with more than one language. Uh, more than one language, which can always be read. Please, please do no longer, it's more than one language, please do no longer. Let's just have no more of this one language thing. Okay, it's, you can read it as an interjection. From this perspective, translation by definition means not reproduction of meaning, but transformation of the attempt to be meaningful. Translation is transformation. And most people working in comparative digital departments, working on translation, would, I think, accept that view. It doesn't help us as professionals to tell our clients that, oh, I'm not wrong, you know, translation is really transformation, and you've got to reject every now, and that'll justify everything I just did. And, uh, uh, this, this view of translation is in the opposite to what anybody in the professional situation would want anybody to believe. But it might be what happens. <laughs> 